the problem with fear is whenever you come from the angle of fear mongering, you can actually scare people into all sorts of things that are not reality. You can tell them the earth is flat and people are likely to look outside their house and say, oh, you know what? Ah, he's probably right. The earth is flat. I'm going to fall off the cliff if I walk too far. People will believe it. And this is where whenever we start to talk to extremes, we just need to take a step back and start to look at this research. For the longest time, when it came to nutrition and kidney disease, part of the issue was nobody really had any data. We had some quote unquote population based trials, but we really didn't have any randomized control studies. Guess what? We have plenty of randomized control studies when it comes into the field of kidney disease. Now, even in dialysis, we're coming up with these randomized studies where we're showing even crazy things where nephrologists back in the day, when we talked about intradialytic exercise, people were like, oh my God, you're telling people to exercise while they're on dialysis, they're going to die. And guys like me were saying, they're going to die if they don't exercise. And now you have a captive audience for three hours. What an amazing thing. Yet we have data on that. So the beauty of what we're talking about here is we want to be evidence-based. We want to make sure that we can back up what we say with data that is well-designed, that's replicated. Any person can publish a study. Science is never built on a study. Science is built on the idea that you do a study in this continent, I do a study in this continent, somebody else does a study on a completely different population. The more times we start to see similar results, the closer we get to the idea that this is true. We never say in science that something is 100% true because we can't. Science is built on the idea of replicating people's works. Nowadays, the dilemma that we face is folks are publishing studies, whether it's an industry group or anybody else, they will publish a study. And then you will have folks in social media who will say, yes, there's a study that says X, Y, and Z is going to cure this. Okay, so there's one study. Now, show me what the issues are. How many people did they pick? Was it blinded? Was it double blinded? Was it randomized? Who's the sponsor? Is it replicated? What are all of those variables? And then we can actually come to some kind of an answer around this. So this fear mongering idea that people are doing around certain foods are going to kill you. I should already be dead because I eat a lot of lentils, a lot of lentils. Um, how do you prevent getting kidney cancer? I'm going to let Dr. Hashmi take that one. Sure. Sure. So, you know, cancer is one of those things that a lot of times it's not something that we did wrong, whether you're talking kidney cancer or you're talking lung cancer. This is not just people who are smoking or colon cancer. There are so many other things that can go into it. There is environmental exposure that you could be eating everything right, but you're living next to a freeway and getting exposure all the time. And that's what's causing it. So when it comes to kidney cancer, there's a lot of things we don't understand why. The good news about kidney cancer is, is it can be caught, it can be treated, we have very good treatments for it. And unlike all sorts of other cancers that can be a lot more severe, kidney cancer does not have to be a death sentence. Once again, medicine, you know, sometimes we have physicians, and I think, you know, Jen will agree, we also have dietitians in the same camp where they're either all nutrition, in all this and they're anti-medicine or they're all medicine and they don't want anything to do with nutrition. What my philosophy has always been is to be like Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan's thing was he would look at all of these guys and say, what's the best I can learn from this person and take it. And then he would put the time into training. If you want to be really good, you want to look at the best of everything, bring it all in. And at the end of the day, we're in the business of saving lives. We're not in the business of making ourselves look good. So wherever we can get help, whether it's from medicine, whether it's from anything else going on, we want to bring it, including the idea of social connection. So that's where kidney cancer, there's so many causes. And I wish I could say it's because, you know, somebody ate burgers and that's why they cause it. No, it's not like that. There are so many different reasons for why it can happen. and I would still tell you to put the burger down. Um, what did yeah, I would say with that too, you know, a lot of times um, 
again, going back to kind of the Instagram, you know, people say, oh, if you'll, if you'll just eat totally plant-based, you'll never get cancer and all, but there is, there are so many things. Um, I actually, my husband actually got cancer and we lead a very healthy lifestyle, but it was from an environmental toxicant that he was exposed to. And so I think sometimes people will blame themselves. They'll say, it must've been something I did wrong. And that's not always the case. So I would just encourage you not to go down that road if if you do end up with kidney cancer. What advice would you be giving differently to someone who you're trying to tell them how to prevent kidney cancer versus someone who, I'm sorry, someone who you're trying to give advice to who's trying to prevent chronic kidney disease versus someone who already has chronic kidney disease? So if I've asked you a bunch of questions so far about how do we prevent this, now if someone comes to you who already has it, what's different about the advice you would give them? Um, well, it depends on what stage they're in. So if they are early, so, so kidney disease is in stages. It's one, two, three, four, five, and then 5D dialysis. Or, and it's in three is broken up into three A, three B. Okay. And so as you go down that line, um, everything changes. And again, it's going to be individualized to every person. But if you're in an earlier stage of chronic kidney disease, um, I would just encourage basically healthy lifestyle, whole food, plant-based, um, not junk vegan, um, exercise, sleep, community, all those things. As we get further down, that's where I begin <clears throat> to really, really dig in with my patients. I say, listen, we are a team we have got to avoid this dialysis chair. Are you with me? And if they're with me, then I say, okay. And we'll look if they are really late stage, but still have some function and are not on dialysis yet, then we, depending on where they are, this is not a blanket statement because it's, again, it's going to be individualized, but sometimes we'll put them on a very low protein diet and supplement back with keto analogs. Those are, those are amino acids that don't have nitrogen. So they don't produce waste. Also, they'll scavenge nitrogen from other protein breakdown um, to, to prevent even further waste from, from going through the kidneys. So I'll take that route. Um, again, that will be, you know, where are they financially? Can they afford it? You know, if not, then we have to figure something else out. We figure it out. Um, if they are on dialysis, that is very hard. And then that depends also on the type of dialysis, because there's a lot of different ways that people can do dialysis. But if they're on dialysis, at that point, you really have to become an encourager. Um, that's a that's a hard life, and um, you know if they're on in center hemodialysis, patients they go they go to the dialysis center three times a week for three to five hours. They sit, and so I encouraged my patients to be the healthiest dialysis patient that you can possibly be. A lot of them would say to me, Jennifer, I did this to myself. I'm sitting here because I did it to myself. I'm like, that's fine. That's the past. Let's move forward. What can we do now? So when we talk about dialysis, uh, exercise in the dialysis center, I did that. I went and I bought peddlers out of my own pocket. I wrote a protocol, sent it all the way up my dialysis company because that I thought it was that important for people to move instead of just sitting for three to five hours. I encouraged them to move even when they are at home. Um, <clears throat> I encouraged them, you know, the, the traditional historical dialysis diet is just void of fiber, void of nutrients. That has got to change. Um, it still lingers on, even though the KDP guidelines have changed. But, um, <clears throat> you know, eat whole healthy foods. Think of yourself as a whole person. And then another really interesting thing for a dialysis patient is <clears throat> encourage them, teach one, and encourage that one to teach their peers. People like to hear from someone that's like them. And so they love, dialysis patients will sit in the lobby and discuss things. And so if you can get some encouragers that say, hey, I love cauliflower and this is how I eat it, um, and then encourage other people to eat healthy foods like that, then you begin to see changes in that dialysis center. So it really depends. It, kidney patients, you know, a lot, a lot of times we like to lump them all into, into one bucket. Even a transplant is going to be totally different than a dialysis. It's going to be totally different than a pre-end stage. And then pre-end stage is going to be totally different from what stage of kidney disease they're in. Um, so there's a lot of nuances to that. But um, again, going back to that hope, there's hope to avoid dialysis. But even if you're on dialysis, 
there's hope to live past that five years. If you take care of yourself, you can live past that five years. I've had patients that have been on for 20 years. So um, just encouraging them to be the best they can possibly be at whatever stage of kidney disease they find themselves in. And should we be doing, is regular exercise enough or should we be doing a breathing exercise like yoga? Um, well, again, that depends on the patient, but they can do regular exercise. The one thing, and they can do both. The one thing to be careful of is, you know, do they, do they have a heart condition? Um, also the access arm. So if they are on hemodialysis, they will have an access in one of their arms. That's how we, um, get to their blood to clean it. That's There's needles that go there and it goes through the dialysis machine and we clean their blood that way. And so they have to be careful if they're doing strength training or something like that, um, you know, to be careful with that arm. Of course, always get cleared by their doctor first um, for any kind of limitations or restrictions. But, you know, I mean, I had patients, there are dialysis patients. What was, there was a, um, oh gosh, I can't remember his name. Dr. Hashmi, you may remember his name that used to speak all the time. He ran marathons. He was a dialysis patient that ran marathons. And he spoke to other dialysis patients saying, hey, don't quit living. And so, you know, I think it depends on the patient. I'm not telling you to go out and run a marathon if you're a dialysis patient, but if you can, and if you're cleared, do it, live your life, be as healthy as you can possibly be. Mm -hmm.